our moderator for an intro. I'd like to note that this session will be recorded and it'll also be available on the Market Links website afterwards. So with that said, I am going to start the recording now and pass it over to Austin for opening remarks. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lauren. running. There we are, more slides. So hello and welcome to Navigating Co-Investment Grants, Lessons from Market Systems Development Programs. As we're pulling up the initial slides, this webinar is hosted by Market Links in collaboration with Lando Lakes Venture 37, ACDI VOCA, and DAI Global. Today's webinar will examine the initial phases of co-investment grant partnerships with lessons learned from three USAID funded market systems programs. Next slide, please. During today's 60 minute webinar, I'll briefly introduce our panelists, give a short background on co-investment grants in a market systems development approach, and then jump into our panel discussion. We will then be able to wrap up the session with about five to 10 minutes of questions and answers. So please, as we go through, put your questions in the chat function. Next slide, please. My name is Austin Musa. I will be moderating today's discussion. I'm a senior program manager with Land Lakes Venture 37 in Washington, DC. I currently support grant programs for two USAID funded market systems development programs. Next slide, please. I'm joined by three distinguished panelists who are managing three very different USAID programs. First, please join me in welcoming Tatiana Milips Zanoskar from ACDI VOCA. Tatiana is the Transformational Partnership and Innovation Fund Manager with the USAID funded Big Small Business Project in Serbia. Next, we are welcoming Gwendolyn Oliver Armstrong Tweed from DAI Global. Gwendolyn is the Grants and Partnership Manager with the USAID Southern Africa Mobilizing Investment Project and she is based in South Africa. Lastly, I'm excited to welcome my colleague at Land Lakes Venture 37, Lucia Zigariza. Lucia is the chief of party for the Feed the Future Rwanda or Wahaze activity. Next slide, please. All three of our panelists are supporting co-investment partnerships through a market systems development approach. When most development stakeholders think of grant making to local partners, it's common to think of funds being awarded directly to a local NGO to implement a new activity or perhaps to an educational institution to conduct research. The full benefit of the grant often goes through that one recipient and to their direct beneficiaries uh, with limited expectation of co-investment, co-partnership. In a market systems development approach, implementers are challenged to co-design grants in partnership with a variety of different market actors from this slide, with the ultimate goal of influencing the broader ecosystem with which market actors operate, ensuring the market actors are leading the transformation process. This is primarily done through partnerships with the private sector that will provide leverage or cost share as co-investment, but it should be closely aligned with the public sector systems, strategies, and goals. If the co-investment grant is successful, the benefits, impacts, and learnings of the grant should not be felt by just one entity, but impact multiple market actors. During our discussion, you will hear our panelists speak about how they engage with the different market actors on this slide and how they are taking a facilitative approach to bring about changes in the market systems they are targeting. Next slide, please. To award grants through an MSD approach, there are a few common steps in the grant cycle that we'd like to refer to today. First is uh, welcoming. Welcome, Tatiana. Um, Thanks. So the, the, with looking at the grant cycle, the first step is understanding the current opportunities in the market system, developing a market system change strategy, and developing your grant approach to guide how you'll partner with those market actors. With this information in hand, you can engage potential partners, especially the private sector, to begin co-creating potential solutions for market systems issues and craft a formal partnership solicitation. 
Think of requests for applications, annual program statements, and other solicitation mechanisms to request concept notes or applications from market actors. Following the release and competition of your solicitation, you can identify specific market actors who responded and met your evaluation criteria and move into co-designing the activity with these entities as partners. With the project designed, the partner will lead implementation while both parties are continually monitoring and adapting throughout the life of the project based on the market dynamics. When the award period ends, implementers will make a focused effort to measure impacts and learn as much as possible about the successes and challenges of the grant. In a market systems development approach, the grant process is really iterative. Um, often it's not fully closing, but allowing us to learn, adapt, and evolve to build upon identified successes with additional market actors. In today's conversation, we'll specifically focus on the first three steps that you see in this cycle. Next slide, please. I will now hand the microphone over to our first panelist, Tatiana Milic Zanoskar from ACD Ivoca to introduce her current project in Serbia. Next slide, please. Tatiana, over to you. I think we may still have some sound issues. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you, Tatiana. Okay. Hello. Uh, I'm Tatiana from Serbia. Greetings to all. I'm working on USAID's Big Small Businesses project. This is a five-year activity launched in 2022. It's 18.2 million award, which includes 3.2 million in transformational partnership and innovation fund. The project aims to improve performance of the two SME sectors in Serbia, agriculture and food and equipment and machinery. The project efforts are centered on private sector initiatives, co-creation, co-design and partnership development. Market system changes in a complex environment like Serbian require facilitated and adaptive management to ensure that the lessons learned are incorporated in our future actions. The example I want to present today is a partnership developed between the private service provider Center for Business and Innovation Support from Serbia, CPIP, academia, secondary vocational schools, and local municipalities. Uh, this activity responds to the market demands of small metal processing firms for qualified workforce and professional support to help them improve their production. Our grantee, CPIP, introduced solution, which is the practical methodology called rapid product development, the application of 3D printers in creating a wide range of prototypes products for the metal industry. The grant helps the establishment of service and educational center, RPD hub, which offers opportunity for young students to acquire the specialized knowledge and the practical skills to bring the gap between uh, the current educational system and the SME's demand. It also provides targeted industry support for local SMEs. Uh, with three complex prototypes created and 108 participants involved, including 26 uh, faculty students and 55 high school students, and uh, also 27 SMEs, this activity demonstrated success of uh, market system development approach in fostering innovation, education, and workforce development with strong inclusive component. Thank you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Tatiana, for introducing the Big Small Business Project. I would now pass the floor over to Gwendolyn Oliver Armstrong Tweed from DAI. Next slide, please. Thanks. I'm coming from South Africa. I'm working on USAID Southern Africa mobilizing investment. Um, this project uses a combination of grants and technical assistance to support partners within the private sector in, in the Southern African region to kind of catalyze and mobilize in the mobilization of capital and to strengthen the skills, relationships, and information sources and flows necessary to change market behavior and the dynamics across the investment ecosystem in the region. Within, we've only been around for one year, 
Um, we started our first notice of funding opportunity last May. So within the first 12 months, we've been able to award 7.2 million in catalytic grants within the Southern Africa region, which has been immensely impactful for the investment ecosystem. One of our grant partners, Savant Capital, has been awarded a fixed amount grant award for their BUILD program. This grant supports Savant's accelerator program to improve a portfolio of deep tech startups and to improve their financial sustainability, which in turn makes them good pre-seed and seed investee companies for Savant and other venture capital funds within the region. As a result, the grant serves as a to create a seed capital facility for the build program of Savant. This facility will grow based on the performance of the companies that successfully graduate from the build program and attract additional capital, seed and series A funding. The seed capital facility component is revolving and based on performance ultimately allows Savant Capital to fund future cycles of their build program. Um, again, we have about $13 million to still work with that we'll probably award before uh, the beginning of our third year of, pro of implementation. Over to you, Austin. Thanks, Gwendolyn. Really interesting. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, our final panelist will be Lucia, Z Lucia Zigariza from Land Lakes Venture 37. Over to you, Lucia, and next slide. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lucia Zigiriza. I'm the chief of party for Feed the Future Rwanda or We Has Activity being implemented by Land Lakes Venture 37 in Rwanda. I'm pleased to participate in this panel where I'll be sharing Aura We Has experience in implementing a market systems project in Rwanda. Um, the Feed the Future Rwanda or We Has Activity works with local partners and private sector actors in Rwanda to strengthen animal source foods market system. In Kinyaranda, uh, Aurora we has it translates to raising animals for self-sufficiency. The activity supports animal source food producers and consumer households in eight uh, targeted districts of Rwanda to sustainably increase the availability, access and consumption of animal source food through the development of a profitable market. Aurora we has it strengthens our private sector led value chain and increases demand for animal source foods to help people access nutritious foods. With a focus on increasing the nutritional status of women of reproductive age and children. Aura We Has a uses uh, as a market system project uses an evidence uh, driven approach to source, incubate, scale and replicate innovation solutions to address constraints in the market system that hamper animal source food production consumption, and also while uh, boostering, boosting market access to rural areas. Uh, we are in our fourth, fifth year. We have so far completed four years of implementation. The project started in 2019. And uh, when we talk about animal source foods, we mean uh, we, we focus on only poultry, pig, fish, uh, goat, and sheep. Uh, the project value is 15.4 million US dollars with a, a component of the grants uh, equivalent to 1.9 million. Uh, as my colleagues uh, sh shared some of the examples of the investments they've had in their projects, allow me to share one of the investments we've supported the private sector during the past years of implementation. Aura We has a partnered with Zipline, which is a drone company in Rwanda, to enhance access to pig artificial insemination technology via drone delivery service for veterinary specialists in targeted districts, as I mentioned, the eight districts, to help farmers access earnings from production of high quality livestock. Uh, being a market system uh, project, we were trying to address a constraint related to the use of unreproductive breeds. Through these partnerships, uh, these drones uh, that are being uh, facilitated or led by Zipline, they fly and deliver products packages at high speeds uh, to different locations, even covering far distances within a short period. And for a case of a, a country like Rwanda that is hilly, uh, for farmers to access such services, they usually have to spend like three and a half hours to go look for quality breeds. But with this improved technology, it only takes like 20 minutes to have these services. So partnering with Zipline 
has helped to cut down most of the courses that, uh, costs that the farmers have been incurring and has helped to increase access to breeding services. This is one of the examples that I've shared, but we have over 255 investments that we have facilitated that are led by the private sector here in Rwanda and focusing on only those four value chains that I've mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. Now let's bring all of our panelists together for the first time. We'll start with the first section of the MSD grant making cycle, which is really about understanding the current opportunities in the market system, developing a market systems change strategy, and developing our grant approach to guide how we'll partner with market actors. We know this first step alone, especially when it comes to developing a market systems change strategy, could warrant a whole series of MSD webinars. So with the limited time, we're just going to touch on this very briefly as it relates to grants. My first question is going to be for Gwendolyn. Gwendolyn, you mentioned recently starting up a grant making program in, for the Southern Africa Mobilizing Investment Program and already getting a lot of funds out the door to the private sector. You know, what are some considerations to be made when designing a partnership approach and a grants manual? You know, things that are not normally discussed or might be forgotten that could impact implementation much later in the project. Sure, yeah, thanks Austin. So there's a number of things to consider. One, adapt your grants manual to work within the market system strategy of your project. Customize to customize notice of funding opportunities or NOFOs. Uh, thinking about the audience you're trying to reach, the sector actors that could potentially have leverage within the ecosystem and the context of the funding within the countries you are working in as you're designing the project's um, partnership approach. Three, reduce administrative burden to the private sector and speed up the internal evaluation process of the project by creating simplified templates for application submission. This could be keeping the page limits very low or utilizing pitch decks. Ensure that your entry points to the project are very user-friendly and tailored for a very targeted audience. For collaborate with USAID. On mobilizing investment, we have had a very collaborative uh, relationship with our USA counterparts at every point along the grant process flow. From modifying the default approval thresholds within our grant manual to reviewing with USAID our shortlisted concepts along the way, which has ultimately sped up the evaluation and approval timelines of our grant awards. Exceptions, things to think about. One of the driving principles of market systems is building the brands of the private sector actors the project works with. And in order to do this, it may be necessary to get USAID branding and marking exceptions prior to the project uh, issuing grant awards. So this was something that USAID Mobilizing Investment was able to do with our USAID counterparts at the Regional Southern Africa Mission. Um, it, this has been extremely impactful to the market for our mobilizing investment uh, grant partners. Six, think about what type of grant agreement instruments you're planning on using. Um, think about you know, using fixed amount awards or renewal awards that are not as administratively burdensome to the private mm -hmm. sector actors that you work with. Um, you, these are different instruments that you can, that can use to test activities in the market. Um, they're very adaptable and they're easy to amend within the period life cycle of a grant. Training. During a project startup, build an internal project team beyond the grants team that is trained in facilitation and the project's partnership agreement approach. And finally, when developing the indicators for your project, try to find the right balance with the M&E indicators between what is driving business decision making for your partners and what USA needs for report reporting purposes. So these are just the, some of the number of things that we thought about on mobilizing investment uh, when kind of deciding our strategy for partnership engagement. There's so many more, but we don't have enough time to go through them all. Thanks, Gwendolyn. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And we're going to go one more. And my this is going to be the question for Tatiana and Lucia. Uh, so Tatiana and Lucia, based on your experience in Serbia and Rwanda, you know, aside from public calls for proposals and RFAs, you know, what are some approaches you have both used successfully to identify potential private sector partners, especially knowing that private sector actors may have never applied for donor funding in the past? So any recommendations you'd, uh, you'd provide to us, uh, Tatiana? I'll go to you first.
Jeg kunne med sænke sammen, tak til Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Go yeah. ahead. Okay. Uh, at the initial phase of our project, uh, we conducted a thorough analysis of both sectors, uh, which we are working to identify key market actors uh, with the partners being the crucial part of this analysis. Uh, we designed an internal tool, Pathway of Change, to help the team navigate through project implementation goals, incorporate the MSD approach, and come up with the partner's selection strategy and communication messages to the public and targeted stakeholders. After that, uh, our technical team organized and conducted group meetings and project presentations both at the government and the local level, and also conducted one-on-one -on -one meetings with pre-selected partners to ensure that this intervention aligns with our goals and we have shared values with our partners. Uh, in our experience, the one-on-one -on -one meetings at the initial phase before the solicitation is issued uh, give more room for better knowing the partner and more time to engage in co-creation or co-design, as was the case with our RPD Hub activity, where multiple stakeholders were involved in the intervention. And our leading partner emerged as uh, TPIP, emerged as a recognized and reputable training service provider in South Serbia, they are experienced with the donor fund project, but uh, we need some time to explain them uh, the MBS, MSD approach and also USAID requirements because both of them were to some extent the novelty for them and it took time for us to co-create uh, and finalize their application for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Over to you, Lucia. Thank you, Austin. Um, yes, for the case of Rwanda, uh, also as a market system uh, project, we adopted the evidence-based implementation approach um, that helped us to begin with uh, different research studies. Um, among the studies that we conducted, it included um, the market system analysis, analysis that helped us to have an overview of the focused uh, value chains and uh, also determine some of the constraints, uh, root causes and opportunities within this value chain. We also conducted a behavior change and consumer study that provided an overview of consum consumer behavior and behavioral drivers. And lastly, we conducted another study uh, on gender and social inclusion uh, to have an overview of the household and gender dynamics uh, during nutrition decision. Having conducted all of these uh, studies, they helped us to have a great resource of information in designing our strategy, and not only that, but uh, also identifying potential partners. Uh, they also provided us a comprehensive narrative of the project portfolio, its priority constraints, as I mentioned, uh, root causes and uh, potential opportunities within these value chains. So from that step, our project team developed a pipeline of potential activities and market actors across the different interventions. Uh, the potential actors were directly engaged by our technical team through the unsolicited approach to further explore potential areas for collaboration in addressing the identified constraints uh, during the market analysis. Uh, the team continuously screened uh, these uh, potential uh, partners and activities to determine whether they should progress to the design and co-creation phase. And this has to, first of all, go through the approval by the technical team. And when that was approved, uh, the technical team uh, moved forward uh, with uh, this uh, co-creation process to ensure that the proposed innovations by these private actors are well aligned with the project objectives. And uh, from that, we also had to work with them to ensure that the, there's, a, there's a clear uh, concept note uh, outlining the proposed activity and also to ensure that it aligns with the identified uh, constraints and root causes. And then from that, we went into the full development of an activity. And this is usually a process that involves the technical team 
uh, that requires a technical team to work closely with these private actors. And for some of the private actors that are not usually interested in these uh, requests for applications, public requests for applications, we also worked on another approach, uh, which we call uh, targeted uh, RFA, to ensure that we attract some categories of market actors that are not usually interested. Uh, like in our case, there are some meat actors who are not usually interested in these um, kind of RFAs, so we approach them. We developed a targeted RFA, targeting some of the meat aggregators, uh, meat product aggregators, processors, and retailers. And after this process, uh, the project team went on with uh, different orientation sessions at the district level to ensure that these uh, partners are well aligned with our expectations and the application process. So these two um, approaches have helped us to engage some of the partners that are not usually uh, interested in these public um, requests for applications. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. Go to the next slide, please. So Gwendolyn, I want to come back to you when thinking about um, APSs and like how, how do you choose an approach? You, when do you use an APS? When do you prefer to release an RFA? When do you decide not compete it? You know, how do you figure out your kind of strategy for the release and how what type of NOFO you might use? Yeah, so you want to think about the marketing strategy of the project and how the project will insert itself within the market. How can the project creatively use notice of funding opportunities to, to essentially promote market systems and USAID um, and think be beyond the usual branding of a NOFO, i.e. a annual program statement? Uh, an APS is completely unknown to the private sector. So branding your NOFO as a request for concepts succinctly tells the market what the project wants, concepts. Um, sometimes grants are also unknown within the private sector. So in information sessions, maybe market um, catalytic grants explaining it is concessional capital. It's an influx of funds to allow a private business to reach the next level faster, reducing their business timelines. Um, in market systems projects, the project should never be prescriptive with their solicitations. It should be very responsive. So utilizing requests for concepts allows the market to inform the project what is needed. And I normally never recommend um, non-competed grants. It's very hard to do um, and justify. So because the market is there and it's one of the things that we want to look into and see what's needed. RFAs, kind of what Lucy was talking about for grant funding, um, are really great to be targeted. Um, in my opinion, they could be used in latter years of a project. Once the project has implemented a number of activities through their open calls for content concepts. Um, and it's a way for you as a project to see areas where a targeted NOFO may be beneficial for the ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, next slide, please. So to Tatiana and Lucia, you know, when you first begin the co-design process with a new co-investment partner, new private sector partner, how have you worked with the actors to really introduce the market systems development approach and how it will influence the grant development process. Because we know a market systems development approach is, is unique. It is something different that most actors are not going to be familiar with. Uh, Tatiana? Yes, thank you. Uh, I will explain that uh, on our activity RFB Hub. Uh, the project and the partners co-designed this activity from the initial idea to only train the stud students to establish an educational and support center that provides an avenue for youth involvement and learning with the private sector, uh, along with addressing industry needs for skilled workforce and specialized services. We had several one-on-one -on -one meetings with the partner grantee to discuss their idea and also several meetings with the other key local actors that are naturally involved in the proposed activity for example, academia, vocational schools, municipalities, and representatives of targeted SMEs. Uh, these sessions help to explain what is the market system development and uh, how comprehensive this approach is and uh, what is expected to be impacted uh, and how it will impact the overall eco ecosystem. We discussed with partners their understanding of this approach and their specific roles in the process 
desired outcomes and expected changes that will define the, the success of this activity. For example, is, is that the new service for SMEs, new training, educational course, curriculum, youth inclusion, etc. The idea was there. It was a market-driven solution, and the project effort was to co-design the roles and responsibilities and require stronger inclusivity through inclusion of women, old, and youth on SMEs. This was an interactive process in which the project helped the partners think more systemically, connecting with each other, collecting relevant data for the activity preparation, and also considering expanding their own businesses. This activity made changes in perceiving collaboration and roles of partners in addressing local development. EPIP was willing to expand their business portfolio to offer combined educational and specialized services within one center to help the SMEs reduce the cost of the final product. Uh, through this innovative prototype design approach, uh, SMEs were more responsive and competitive at the market. Uh, SMEs, on the contrary, are prepared to use the newly offered service and to pay for, for that, and also to employ skilled and qualified workforce to improve their performance. Academic <laughs> and vocational schools are, uh, have the interest to engage in this project as a new course curriculum uh, that will bring new students with the prospects of employment in the private sector, and municipalities also are interested to participate to prevent the depopulation to have vibrant SME sector and uh, more youth, young people employed and fully integrated in their respective communities. Thank you. Thanks, Tatiana. Lucia, um, can you speak to kind of how you introduced the MSD approach in some of these conversations? Thank you, Austin. Uh, same as other projects, uh, implementing this new approach, uh, it required us to conduct several introduction sessions on market system to our staff, because uh, most of them had never implemented a market system project, uh, also including our consortium members, uh, USAID um, as representatives, because they are the donor, and also other public institutions, our line ministry, the Ministry of Agriculture and Animal Resources, and as well as Rwanda Agriculture and Animal Resource Development Board. Uh, also including the districts where we, we, we intervene and uh, the relevant private actors. Uh, these introduction sessions were conducted uh, during the project, project launch event, but it was also followed by other several uh, engagement sessions with private actors, the relevant private actors, to ensure that they have a better understanding of the principles and the systemic approach to addressing challenges within the animal source food market. Upon completing the introduction phase, uh, we advanced with the co-creation phase in collaboration with the identified uh, potential partners from our pipeline, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so from that, uh, to el also help us understand how this process goes, allow me to share one of the examples of the co-creation we had with some of the financial institutions here in Rwanda to address the constraints related to limited access to finance for diverse investment opportunities in livestock businesses. Uh, this began with um, going to our pipeline and identifying the potential financial institutions that we had, uh, we had during the different uh, studies that we had conducted and uh, helping the technical team to work closely with these financial institutions to ensure that their innovations that they're suggesting are well aligned with the project um, goals, ensuring that they're feasible, sustainable, and are really addressing the root causes that we identified during these studies. Uh, therefore, to ensure that we come to a concrete uh, innovation, it requires several business meetings. Therefore, our team had to hold several business meetings to verify whether there's a clear business model whether the finance uh, institution staff have the required skills, there's commitment of the financial institutions, there's also resources because they have to uh, have a skin in the game. And also ensuring that there's a clear plan for implementing the proposed innovation. So when all of that uh, is clear, we move, into, uh, we move forward with implementation. 
I'm happy to share that uh, through this kind of co-creation process, uh, these financial institutions have helped to increase the capacity of their staff. Uh, being in a small livestock value chain, most of the financial institutions did not have an understanding of the dynamics in this value chain. So through the capacity building, they got to understand and uh, go to tailor financial products uh, in livestock. They also developed digital uh, solutions because um, some of them, there were, there were microfinance institutions that were still using papers and uh, it, it, it's such a lengthy process. So they moved to the digital solutions, which cut down the loan processing period. And uh, we also worked with them to increase the awareness so that the users can get to know the opportunities within the financial institutions and then break the barrier that they have in terms of access to finance. So um, with that, they're able to have uh, uh, the working capital they need to, to buy different inputs for their businesses in livestock, uh, buying uh, feeds, buying vet services, and also be able to reach economies of scale. So with that, it's an example that uh, I have shared for us to understand the process entailed and how it helps to improve most of the businesses here and uh, enhance uh, the investments for most of the private sector uh, investments in livestock. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. Go to the next slide, please. And talk more about uh, co-design, partnership identification, you know, how we really partner. And Gwendolyn, I want to come back to you. You know, um, grants or subawards are assistance mechanisms that are routinely used here. But we also know that subcontracts could also be an important tool uh, for some market systems partnerships, right? You got to have a lot of tools in the toolkit. Um, can you speak to when subcontracts might be a better fit than a subaward? Sure. Normally it's under technical assistance um, that you want to, am I on mute? No, I'm okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in my opinion, grants are highly beneficial for a market systems project um, as it allows the private entity to manage all aspects of an activity's implementation, build relationships with auxiliary vendors, begin to gain a track record within the market and build their own brand. Um, if a project only has a procurement fund, it, it's, it's not necessarily the best mechanism for a market system project because if you're wanting to, as I said before, allow that uh, entity to grow within the, within the industry they're working with, they can't necessarily receive uh, subcontracts. Um, procurement needs to be managed by the project and it's defined by US uh, government uh, competition requirements. So funds can be met, managed um, unless it's, can't be managed by the partner unless it's, um, you know, properly competed uh, within the market. So when you're, when a project is being designed, you know, kind of like at the uh, USAID RFA, RFP stage, you know, allowing a project to have a mixture of grants and procurement mechanisms to pull from is the most ideal design for a market systems project. Grants can be utilized by the partners while a procurement slash a subcontracts uh, can be utilized by the project to support a broader eco ecosystem for multiple beneficiaries benefit. So you want to use subcontracts for a large number of beneficiaries. Um, a lot of times um, that can be done through technical assistance, especially if you're working on regulatory um, needs. Maybe it's a, a international consultant coming in or even a local regional consultant to come in and assist um, the project to kind of move the needle in certain regulatory uh, frameworks. So that would be my recommendations. Thanks, Gwendolyn. Yeah, I found that to be really, really impactful to be able to work with uh, procurements and support other groups through contracts to get them ready for larger grants and really focused um, co-creation. So co-creation and co-design, we realize are so important in the market systems development approach, but they're also quite time consuming. And you're usually trying to co-create and co-design with multiple partnerships simultaneously. So I'd like to go back to Gwendolyn first, perhaps, but uh, Gwendolyn and then the rest of the team, do you have any quick tips or tricks on how to co-design with the private sector without it taking, you know, taking months of time and keeping in mind we're, we're working on multiple at once? Yeah, so the project internally should have a collaborative technical team with the ability to facilitate, delegate, and manage a portfolio of 
potential partners. Um, in the pre-award stage, there should always be two tracks um, that the project is working on with a potential grant applicant. Um, you know, you have the project will be led through the co-design of the program uh, description by the technical team. And then you have the, a grant lead that will be running the, the grant uh, potential applicant through the due diligence track. Um, so they can be going simultaneously with the partner. And you have a number of uh, staff members helping a portfolio of different applicants. Um, so hopefully you have the capacity um, to look at the number of grantees that you could be having being churned through at a time and have the number of staff that that's needed. And I normally think that uh, for, you know, a grant portfolio, one person can probably manage about 10 to 12 of those uh, partnerships at a time, um, especially in the pre-award stage. As the program description starts coming together, you want to start looping in M&E and communications prior to award. It's key to ensure the proper understanding of the partnership from all parties um, up into the ward so they know what they're getting into after award when it comes to communications how what different audiences we're working with what are the indicators do you have tracking indicators or are they target indicators um, you want to involve the project's usa counterpart in the co-design process from from as soon as possible when applicable um, because they want to be involved in that process invite them to meetings with the with the potential partner um, it really gets their buy-in early on before they even see the grant that is going to be awarded the project should always be moving as fast as the, as the partner applicant if a partner cannot work on the grant application due to an investor committee or other business activities, it means that that project's support is just a small piece of the applicant's business plan. And that partner is a serious entity in the market. Um, so they're really great to be working with. And that's a great story to be telling. Oh, well, we can't you know, meet with this because they're meeting with their investors. That's a great story to tell USAID. It's essential to ensure the internal workings of the project are working in tandem for the partners, um, communicating expectations and facilitating the entire process to award. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. I'll pass it over to Tatiana. Any brief points you'd like to add? And can we go to the next slide as well? Tatiana, to you. Yeah, basically, uh, what we did on, on our project uh, is uh, developed uh, the aforementioned pathway of change. Uh, well, this uh, helped us uh, to uh, select the co-creation or co-design approach. And uh, also, it helped us prioritize uh, the uh, initiatives that really can uh, be most uh, can fast track to the approval. Uh, for example, we developed also simple assessment question uh, that um, can also help design uh, decide uh, which are uh, those initiatives that uh, uh, will be selected to a fast track for co-design and approval process. Uh, broadly, the fast track partnership is, includes, in our case, uh, trade fairs, B2B opportunities, access to finance, uh, the uh, interventions that did not uh, need many uh, uh, engagement uh, in, in a co-creation. Uh, one of these uh, initiatives is, for example, uh, the conference uh, that brings uh, together buyers from the EU market and suppliers from Serbia, which uh, actually enhance uh, in and increase sales opportunities for the, sec for the sector of machinery and equipment, and also save uh, the money for uh, SMEs because we are bringing uh, the potential buyers to a well-organized and designed event in, in Serbia rather to spend time traveling abroad. Thank you. Thanks, Tatiana. Lucia, with your work with Rwanda or Wahazi, any tips and tricks for how you'd like to co-design relatively quickly with partners? Uh, thank you. Uh, during this process, uh, when we are engaging private partners, uh, at times they submit concept notes. So when they submit these concept notes, we have to ensure that these concept notes have um, an outline of the proposed activity and uh, 
as a market system project, of course, we have to ensure that there's a clear constraint that they want to address and the root causes that are being targeted. And um, again, uh, we have to determine if this proposed solution is well aligned with the project goals and is feasible. So having uh, the technical team that is involved in this process upon uh, the review and approval of the concept note, then we enter into the co-design uh, step. So in our case, we develop what we call the activity design document. When we started the project, uh, this process could take long. It could take like one to two months, most especially uh, working in a nascent uh, value chain, small livestock. Some of the partners did not have the information we needed uh, to have a full proposal in terms of their business to prove that it's viable. So it could take more time. Uh, but in that process, uh, we had to ensure that we have several meetings with the partner, ensure that their business model is clear. We have the result chain to ensure that we achieve what we, we, we want as a project. And also checking whether it, it has the potential for scale and also not forgetting uh, cross-cutting themes like gender and social inclusion, environment considerations. And we also have to consider some of the risks that might be in this innovation and uh, put up some of the mitigation measures. Again, to meet the needs of our private sector, we, we also simplified this process. The activity design document is in a PowerPoint template. When we began, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint could go to 60 slides, but in the, as time went on, we went on simpli simplifying the process. At this moment, uh, the, the, the template has reduced to 25 slides in order to adjust and meet the timelines of our partners. And not only that, even helping the reviewers, don the donor USAID to have um, a document that is uh, user-friendly. And again, to cut down the time it takes in the co-design process, we had to ensure that the technical team involved, be the grants team, be the mail team, are part of the design process. Because if it's done uh, in a simultaneous um, way, it reduces the time it takes um, or the bureaucracy involved in this. We're having some sound issues. Team, is anyone else hearing, Lucia? And the partners. You will allow me again to share one of the example of a partnership. Um, I hope. Go ahead, Lucia. We have you back. Okay. We lost. You. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I was mentioning that we had to cut down some of the steps or the, the processes, the documentations required to ensure that we meet the needs of, of the private sector. So a document that uh, had like 60 slides was reduced to 25 slides. And to ensure that we involve all the technical team uh, that is required, the grants team, the mail team, uh, and then ensure that the process is done simultaneously and have a full package that is needed for required reviews and approval by the donor. So after all of those processes, we had to move forward with the implementation since both the project and the partner had the same understanding of the innovation. Allow me to share another example of one of the partnerships we, we co-created in, in that um, approach. Uh, Again, um, we, as, uh, as a market system project, we always have to ensure there is a specific constraint we are trying to address. So we partnered with one of the large scale poultry producers here in Rwanda called Absol uh, to champion and popularize the ready to lay pullets model. It's an innovative uh, pullet model scheme that builds the capacity of the workforce by combining both the placement of high quality pullets with commercial producers of egg layers. Uh, this ready to lay pullet model offers the best competitive cost advantage over raising their old chicks. As you know, they, they're, they're a bit delicate and for most farmers, it's a challenge for them to raise them up to the laying rate. So with this innovation, it helps farmers to reduce uh, the extended time they take in, in, uh, in rearing uh, 
these birds up to the laying stage. So they are given it's they are given to farmers at a stage of 16 weeks, and after a short period they start laying eggs. Uh, this this approach that we have piloted with Absol has helped to minimize disease risk associated with critical stage of bullets development and also offered producers reliable income from egg cells shortly after initial investment. And uh, again, as a project that is aiming at um, increasing the consumption of animal source food, this model has helped to increase egg production in Rwanda. And uh, with the egg kiosks that are being um, set up in different locations, they help people to easily access eggs or buy eggs within their local community. And in one way, it's also helping to increase uh, the consumption and um, address some of the malnutrition issues uh, in the community. And not only that, it has also helped to increase uh, farmers' livelihoods by strengthening their production and farming capacity to operate and sustain the ready uh, to lay pullet model. So this is an example of one of the partner partnerships we have co-created going through this uh, approach and ensuring it is not lengthy or it doesn't involve uh, such a, a bureaucracy that is usually annoying for some of the private actors. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. So I realize we're running a little late on time and I want to make sure we get time for our question and answer because everybody's very interested to ask questions and they're coming through the chat here. So I'm going to wrap up with just one more question and ask each of the panelists to be limit themselves to about 60 seconds, maybe one example. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, it is really to tell us about an innovative partnership agreement or mechanism that you've used through the MSD project. So Gwendolyn, I'll start with you, then we'll go to Lucia and Tatiana. Okay. All right. So much of the impact of market systems activities happens beyond the usual time horizon of a grant. Um, so through facilitative discussions, um, have um, these discussions with how to continue that partnership beyond the grant end dates and sharing of data for indicator tracking. Um, so you want to integrate pause and reflect sessions into the agreements and a pathway for this continued partnership outside of a formal agreement as the grant agreement reaches its close. So discuss during the pre-award. Um, so you have to think all the way back uh, to the pre-award stage and setting up that long-term uh, partnership um, and for potential collaboration, data sharing, and a longer term, maybe even MOU with the grant partner. Um, you want to write this into the grant agreement as an expectation of collaboration for the remaining duration of the project, your project's lifespan. Mm -hmm. So when you get, if you have a, like a 24-month grant during the 23rd month, you would enter into an MOU that would allow you to continue to get data and the key indicators that you're needing, that's for their business, but also for USAID. And you're tracking that for the lifetime of the project, not just the grant uh, period of performance. And you can write that into the grant award. So that's just an example um, to kind of think innovatively about how to do uh, agreements. Thanks, Quinn. Really interesting. Uh, Lucia, we're gonna to go to you next. Uh, we've got just a minute and then we'll finish with Tatiana. Thank you, Austin. Uh, among some of the innovative approaches or grant uh, partnerships we have implemented under Aura, we, has, we have had formal and informal uh, partnerships. Uh, we have an example of one of our uh, private actor partner who, through the co-creation process, uh, needed uh, a number of equipments, and we found that some of the equipment he was requesting was uh, expensive so we helped him uh, to have because he's in the uh, egg aggregation and uh, distribution model we supported them to set up an egg um, a selling point and uh, equipping it with uh, shells but he also needed um, a machinery to make egg trays but the machinery was very expensive so we through the the, the research um, and the market information we had we identified find that there was another private actor who had uh, a tray making machine but did not have the, the the demand so what we supported that other private actor was to conduct a market research and help him to know 
who are the potential buyers of egg trays. So one of them we already had was uh, this company called Gakoproko. So we identified several uh, buyers of egg trays, uh, connected um, them, uh, made these business linkages between the egg producers and the egg tray manufacturer. So as you can see in this example, there was one partner, which is Gako Proko, who benefited from the grant, and another partner who benefited just from our technical um, assistance uh, through the market uh, research. But it helped to address the constraint that was in the market, uh, and they helped them to uh, move forward with their businesses. And another model we use under Aura, we has a, is what we call clustering grants. Uh, as a, a project that aims at uh, increasing the, the access and consumption of animal source food, we have different categories of, of uh, partners. We have saving, saving and lending groups. We also have cooperatives. And looking at the pipeline that we had, it was very hard for us to have a grant agreement or um, the, like I mentioned, the, the co-creation process for each and every saving group. So we clustered them together and did the co-creation process as one. Uh, for, for one category for the saving groups and another category for the cooperatives. And then the technical assistance that we provided was also uh, clustered. So this helped us to serve different categories of partners uh, through that clustering. So the documentation was done for one category, but we managed to serve 127 groups and um, 20 cooperatives. And again, we had another cluster of meat actors who also had the same business model. We had uh, about 14 butchers that benefited from our grant and uh, about four um, slaughterhouses. So similar businesses were clustered together and then the co-creation process was done like one and the TA was also done as one. So it, help, it helped us to serve more private actors and address uh, some of the constraints in the uh, livestock market. So these are some of the examples I've shared for, for the benefit of saving time, but these are some of the innovations that we can use in order to serve or uh, address some of the constraints in collaboration with different uh, partners. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. Tatiana, um, any brief yes. examples? You can share? Yes, the brief. <laughs> sure. uh, well, our projects uh, encourage uh, unexpected partnerships uh, and initiatives where local NGOs are supporting private companies by assisting them in writing project proposals, reporting, uh, collecting data, analysis of data, and prepare that for their business growth. Uh, NGO obviously have better writing project proposal skills, while the private sector is less experienced with the donor's requirements, but has better ideas and are more is more adaptable to the market system development approach. And this approach we are cultivating may so, uh, support and help private sector to assess different sources of funding while focusing on their core businesses. We have several successful uh, projects with uh, doing that, especially the projects uh, that uh, are related to agriculture and digitalization in agriculture and precision farming. Thank you. Thanks, Tatiana. Given our available time, we'll need to end the discussion there and hopefully we can get a few minutes of Q&A with our team. So we have a few questions that have come in. The first question I'd like to start with is for Gwendolyn. Um, Gwendolyn, how do you balance, is something you spoke to earlier, but how do you balance donor visibility requirements and an MSD approach and also address the issue of restricted goods? Complex question. Um, yeah. So um, a lot of times it could be restricted goods, it could be ICT, it could be intellectual property, it could be will this grant activity receive revenue during the grants period of performance. Um, a lot of times as you're designing the program description, um, it's really good to have the grant lead be there in those co-design projects, someone that understands US reg re regulations, restrictions concerning funding. I think um, trying to figure out, um, is that something that the grant should maybe pay for or is that a 
something that 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 the partner could find other ways or other sources of that funding if it involves restricted commodities because the timeline or the time lag to get those approvals are just maybe detrimental to the actual project so maybe offsetting um that company's payroll and having them you know maybe use the payroll that we would have the grant pay for the payroll and then have them buy the restricted commodities themselves outside of the grant as their contribution um, or their their you know good faith um, as a part of the activity so that w the grant itself is not p buying the restricted commodity or they're not you know entering into platform design um, for ICT or creating entire systems so thinking about and strategizing working with the partner to find other ways um, to fund the business activities of the partner uh, I think for and making sure that it's an allowable um, and allocable um, expenditure line i think are ways to during the co-design process that you can really work it out um, and find ways to implement a number of different activities but not trigger a number of restricted commodity um, things that would just derail um, the the implementation process i hope that's answering it <laughs> i think so i'd like to go to tatiana with a question as well uh, tatiana how do you work with other programs in a given area to reduce overburdening the same partner or duplicating grants that have been provided to the same partner earlier? Um, and what do each of you do um, differently in grant design to encourage participation of women-led businesses? So how do you engage women-led businesses? And then how do you avoid going to the same partner that other entities might also be seeking to work with in Serbia? Well, in Serbia, uh, we have um, a small country and a lot of donors, so we know each other. <laughs> and we uh, also do a, a lot of conferences and uh, just uh, trying to uh, avoid all overlapping between us. We are discussing what are their approach and uh, what is our approach. Uh, in most cases, uh, other donors are approaching central government to uh, try to uh, make some changes in the ecosystem that is within the government uh, responsibility. We, on the other hand, are implementing locally uh, led activities, and we are working mostly with the local communities uh, and the local partners to design the activities that spur their their, their local local development. So, uh, in that sense, uh, we are complementary to uh, the uh, other donors uh, which uh, uh, who are doing uh, this on the uh, government level and we are doing that some of that initiatives down to the local level. Thank you, Tatiana. Um, I'd like to go to Lucia and maybe Gwendolyn, you could speak to this as well as, you know, we have these complex grant processes that we go through and we have an ideal pathway that we think it should go and check off all the boxes. You know, where do you find that pathway is often breaking down and you're having more challenges? And why do you feel like you're having challenges with that particular step? Uh, thank you, Austin. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, we used to have a challenge uh, moving from the concept node to the full activity design uh, process. Uh, we, we usually encounter the challenge of not having uh, enough information to be able to develop a full proposal, um, mainly it's because most of the partners didn't have a clear business plan in place. And uh, with that, we had to go back and uh, do uh, technical ass assistance. We provided technical assistance for most of our private uh, partners to ensure that we have a, a, a clear business model that we can work on. So this challenge um, was very common. As I said, uh, small livestock is a, such an ascent, at an ascent stage in Rwanda. So moving uh, from that uh, step, we were now able to get the full information we need to develop a full proposal. So not only that, even um, using the other approach I mentioned for the targeted uh, RFA to ensure that we meet um, this category of market actors who are not well positioned to go into the activity uh, design process and through the RFA it was much easier because uh, it had uh, less um, 
steps or it was more simplified to ensure that we also work with this category of uh, partners so in 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 this uh in this uh, approach it requires to have a strong uh, private sector uh, which was not in the, the case in Rwanda for small livestock, but when all um, is available in terms of a clear business model, it's usually easy to co-create um, an activity with them. And uh, during our third year, uh, close to our fourth year, it, it was more simplified and it could take even uh, a month to finish the process that used to take like more than two months. So that's the challenge we encountered uh, during implementation. Thank you. Gwendolyn, any, any sticking points in your process that you found? Um, normally when there's sticking points, and a lot of times it's all about um, all the different annexes, the due diligence process, the mm. hand-holding, um, and again, it's all about your staffing. And when I said earlier, you know, if you know you have X number of millions of dollars and you estimate your sizes of your grants, what are the sizes of the grants to impact that ecosystem? You can kind of design and figure out the number of staff that you need. And if handholding is needed, if you need to translate applications, if you need to simplify, make them pictographs, you know, you, there are ways for you to adapt um, the regulations to adapt what we're getting. Again, getting competition done and over with allows you to handhold and work with the partners, get them through the processes. There's no conflict of interest when you have already selected and shortlisted a partner. You can be as involved in that process as you see fit. And again, having a portfolio, having, you know, if you know you're going to issue about 40 grants, then have have four grant team members. That's 10 per team. They're at various stages. You know, you have some that are pre-award, some that are post, some are the closing out. Again, the heavy lifting is in the pre-award. So maybe have your grant staffing be up front in the project during the first couple of years to get grants out and then coming back. So trying to find ways um, to be adaptive, again, internally within a project, you should be adaptive. You should be thinking of the systems. How are we getting involved and in everything? And so definitely thinking just about internally, we're a system, how can we work as a team and not throw it onto one person? Um, so again, handholding, making annex is very simple, making that process, sitting down with them, have them come in, do the UEI with them. Nothing says we can't do that. You can be involved in the application process with your partners because there's, you're there and you're their partner too. And if they succeed, we succeed as a project. So help them along the way. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Complete, completely agree. It is definitely an adaptive management process and certainly something that we find we need to get everybody engaged. A few more staff involved with it can't just be one grant manager trying to do dozens of grants at the same time. So it's really a team effort around grants and MSD. And we've just got time for one more question. Gwendolyn, I'm going to throw back to you because you brought up data and Mel, so you knew people were going to ask questions about that. Um, so I'll try to read the question as it's as it's written. So okay. to what extent is the MEL angle a point of tension or a challenge? You know, you're trying to balance the demands of the USAID standard indicators with the aim of collecting data via your partnership award, but you're also trying to work through their natural business metrics. You know, mm -hmm. specifically you're capturing secondary direct participants, estimating indirect impact or outreach. You know, it seems like a persistent challenge for many. Yeah. So again, I think it comes down to working with your USA counterpart from the beginning when you're making your LMAP. What are the indicators that are going to be foisted upon our sector, our partners that we're working with? Are these indicators things that they are already collecting? If they're not, is there a bottom line? This is important for you to collect as a business because it's going to help your business grow. Is it possible, you know, if you're an impact fund or if you're planning on doing something and jobs is not a part of your current portfolio of things to be thinking about? But if you kind of say and show the business aspect of it, how do you train? How do you facilitate the the different types of indicators that might be interesting to them as a business. And then you want to think internally the project. 
are there indicators that we don't need the partners to be providing to us? We can kind of glean this these indicators from maybe the market, from maybe data research, from just, you know, maybe doing surveys, spot surveys. Um, when you're thinking and setting up your grant agreements and the indicators, Think about collecting targets beyond the grant period of performance. You know, there, again, as I said, market systems has a very long-term trajectory of impact. And so again, setting it up front that these are indicators, but they're indicators for maybe four years from now when the project ends, that you want to collect that data from them. You've had two years to train them on how to uh, receive this data, how it's important for their business, why it's going to have that impact within the market. Maybe it'll allow them to get other types of funding. Maybe an investor wants them to be an impact fund. Maybe they're in certain sectors. So you're kind of moving them in the direction of thinking of critically about certain indicators. You know, what is um, the deployment? What is capital raise? What are the jobs created? Are you able to to, you know, reach certain targets. Um, so again, I think it's very facilitative with your USAID counterpart to figure out which ones we're going to put onto the grantee and which ones the project ourselves will, will master. And then again, thinking about the timeline of when to collect data that it could be for the entire span of the project. Thanks, Gwendolyn. I, I know we have a few more questions. I think we're going to have to wrap up for today, but we'll do our best. We'll review those and see if we can send out some responses in writing to the team. But for today, I really, it's a great conversation we're starting. I hope we can continue it in other venues this year. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. On the next slide, you will see, let's see, we're moving over. Oh, I think we should have one more with a few resources slide. There we go. Uh, and so if you're interested in learning more in the coming days, we'll, we're going to circulate the PowerPoint. It's going to include some of these links. We'll try to include some answers to additional questions we received. I want to highlight that our friends at ACI VOCA have recently published some operational guidance on adaptive partnerships. And I would highly recommend looking at it. It's linked in here. found it really insightful, um, just engaging new partners, especially local and private sector partners. Um, also, there's going to be an upcoming clinic series called Adaptive Partnerships or systemic impact that's going to be facilitated through the USA, the Feed the Future Market Systems and Partnerships activity. So this will focus on overcoming the operational and procedural challenges faced by MSD projects, seeking to partner dynamically with a range of partners, particularly the private sector. Uh, the clinic seeks to draw on experiences and learnings from peer organizations when it comes to facilitating new types of internal conversations between HQ, the projects, you know, across both technical and operational domains. So stay tuned, you're gonna hear more about it in the future, but uh, a broad call of interest will be sent out about this upcoming series. Additionally, as we had Lucia on the, on the call today from Venture 37 and Oro Wahaze, the Oro Wahaze team recently released a nice blog on the poultry market in Rwanda, which I've referenced here, and Oro Wahaze will be releasing an outcome harvest study in the next few months, showing data actually across the full five years of work there in Rwanda. So I think you'll find it interesting. We'll make sure to post it on Market Links. And we want to thank Market Links for being an amazing host. They have put on an excellent webinar. It's been a pleasure working with them. And they're also a great resource for market systems information. They have a wonderful listserv that'll keep you up to date on the latest news and resources in this area. So if you're not registered there, I would highly recommend it. And next slide, please. And with that, we're going to wrap up today and just say thank you to everyone for joining and special thanks to our panelists, Tatiana, Gwendolyn, and Lucia for sharing your experiences. Wishing everyone a, a great day. Thanks for joining. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.